Hello and welcome to Fire of Learning. I'm Justin. History is filled with moving speeches that rouse readers and listeners centuries or millennia after they're given. Statements which are so bold or witty that they define a person, place, or era. And comebacks which burned so bad that the coffins of people from thousands of years ago are still warm to the touch. The problem is, not all of them were really said. If we go back to the sources of some of history's most famous words, it's not always easy to tell whether or not someone actually said them, or if it was added into someone's legacy later. It's not hard to imagine a monk or someone writing at his desk saying, Oh yeah, that would have been a great comeback, oh yeah, oh yeah. I'm adding that in. If the authors of a famous quote didn't write it down themselves, well, it's not always easy to tell who the original author is. Sometimes quotes are recorded verbatim. Sometimes, though, quotes are mangled, like in a game of telephone, or are attributed to people by accident. And sometimes, people just make them up to tell a good story or support an ulterior motive. In this video, we'll take a look at some of these questionable quotes. Famous quotes that were never said, or at least were said by someone else and falsely attributed to a historical figure. So let's get to it. Before we begin, I would like to thank Alexa, Mark, Juan Manuel Cardoza, Dennis Clark, and Roger Pyle for being our most recent supporters on Patreon. They join these supporters who make these videos possible. Number 1. Et tu, Brute? Julius Caesar, who lived from 100 BC to 44 BC, is one of, if not the most, famous figure in Roman history. He brought an end to the Roman Republic by becoming dictator, and his adopted son later became Augustus Caesar, Rome's first emperor. Julius Caesar was not himself made emperor, though. On March 15, 44 BC, while appearing before the Senate, Caesar was surrounded by around 60 senators and stabbed 23 times to death. As Caesar looked at the angry faces surrounding him, many people believe he said, Et tu, Brute? Which roughly means, Even you, Brutus? Referring to a former friend and ally who had taken part in the assassination. This line, however, comes to us from Shakespeare, around 1500 years after Caesar died. However, it is possible that Caesar said a very similar thing, kai su take non, which is Greek for even you, child. Keep in mind Roman aristocrats were often fluent in Greek. This was reported by the Roman historian Suetonius, who lived from 69 AD to 122 AD, in his De Vita Caesarum, on the life of Caesar. However, he does state that he believes that the most likely story is that Caesar said nothing. Roman historian Plutarch agrees with that and states that Caesar simply covered his face with his toga. Number 2. Consider then, my brothers and comrades in arms, how the commemoration of our death, our memory, fame, and freedom can be rendered eternal. Jumping to 1453 AD with the last true Roman emperor, Constantine XI is often believed to have given a lengthy speech to his soldiers not long before the capital city of Constantinople fell to the invading Ottoman Turks. Then, as the city was falling, he is claimed to have said, The city has fallen, and I am still alive, before proceeding to charge into the battle, never to be seen again. It was one of the most epic moments in human history. But what's the truth? Well, it does seem quite likely that Constantine XI went down fighting with the Empire. His body was never found as he had removed the Imperial regalia from his armor and he was never heard from again. However, did he actually give this famous elaborate speech? It's hard to say. The source is a bit murky. Though likely influenced by eyewitness accounts, the speech itself was very possibly embellished or even totally invented by someone who wasn't even there. It's fairly hard to say what exactly was going on in a city in its final days under Roman or Byzantine rule. We have to ask, did Constantine Pleologos have the time to write such a speech and deliver it to his men? Many of them were starving, exhausted, and likely aware that they were about to die, including the emperor himself. Frankly, we may never know for sure about this one. Number 3. The Ends Justify the Means Niccolo Machiavelli's book, The Prince, is full of all kinds of advice, some of it dirty. Among his advice is his famous quote, The Ends Justify the Means. But while he implies this in a number of passages and even says the final result must be considered, he never actually wrote this quote directly. 
Interestingly, I was skeptical of this one because I have read The Prince, and in that version of the book was this direct quote, so for a while I was confused by this, but it appears to have been added in and was not in the original work. I might talk about that more in a future video, but anyway, moving on, number four. Hier stehe ich, ich kann nicht anders. Here I stand, I can do no other. Martin Luther, no, not that one, yes, that one, is one of the most important figures in the history of the Christian religion. On April 18, 1521, he appeared before the Diet of Worms after having been excommunicated for his heretical challenge to the Catholic Church centered around his disputation on the power of indulgences, or his 95 Theses. Being asked to recant, Luther responded by saying, Unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason, for I do not trust in either the Pope or in councils alone, since it is well known that they have often erred and contradicted themselves, I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot, and will not, recant anything, since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. May God help me. Amen." This appears to be true, however according to legend, he added on, Here I stand, I can do no other. Though this is the most famous part of his response, there's a problem with it. The problem with this is that this latter quote was not recorded by eyewitnesses of the event, nor the transcript of the Diet, and was only added on to the accounts later, most likely to give it a dramatic flair. By the way, fun fact, it isn't known whether or not Luther actually nailed his 95 Theses to the door of the All Saints Church in Wittenberg. This was claimed by Philip Melanchthon, a fellow Lutheran reformer and not by Luther himself, who most likely contacted relevant religious authorities directly rather than cause a scene in public. Number 5. L'État, c'est moi. I am the state. Louis XIV, King of France from 1643 to 1715, certainly did believe that he was the state. He is remembered as the Sun King, referring to his notion that he was the center of France and that everything in the country revolved around him. Though he certainly believed it, whether or not he ever said this exactly is unclear. The or one origin of the quote may be from the German document Reflections of Leopold's Wise Delegations in Toscana, published in 1791, around 80 years after Louis XIV's death. 1791 in France, as you will know if you've seen my French Empires and Republics documentary, was an important time in France, as it was in the middle of a revolution. This quote may have been circulated after it was invented as a way to remind Frenchmen of the tyrannical perspective of their monarch. Though this quote itself may have been invented, Louis's last words are said by numerous witnesses of his death to have been, Je m'en vais, mais l'état de mourra toujours. I am going, but the state will always remain. This sort of implies that he did think of himself as the state. I discussed this in past videos, but the user Toto of Warful gave me the idea to comment on that and make this video, so thank you to him. Number six. I disapprove of what you say, but will defend to the death your right to say it." In her book, The Friends of Voltaire, Evelyn Beatrice Hall created this quote in an attempt to sum up Voltaire's attitude toward a fellow French philosopher. However, there is no record that Voltaire actually ever said or wrote it. Furthermore, she never actually claimed that he did. She was only attempting to represent his attitude. Speaking of all these French people, number seven. Qu'il mange de la brioche, let them eat cake. Or perhaps not, as Marie Antoinette almost certainly never said this. According to the tale, when Marie Antoinette, Queen of France and wife of King Louis XVI, was informed in 1789 of the French people's hunger caused by recent bread shortages, she said, then let them eat brioche. Not exactly cake, but whatever translation thing close enough. The phrase's intention is unclear, but may possibly represent either indifference to the suffering of the people or ignorance of their situation. Possibly both. The problem with this is that there have been no reliable sources that make the claim that she said it. It may have been attributed to her in 1843 by Alphonse Carr. The quote, however, quite frankly appears before the revolution began in Jean-Jacques Rousseau's Confessions, who attributed it to another unknown figure who could not have been Marie Antoinette as she was not yet even queen and was about nine years old at the time of the book's publishing. 
Furthermore, it doesn't even seem to represent the honest attitude of Marie Antoinette. She does not appear to have been quite so oblivious nor callous. There is a record of a letter she sent to her family in Austria which states, It is quite certain that in seeing the people who treat us so well despite their own misfortune, we are more obliged than ever to work hard for their happiness. The king seems to understand this truth. Number 8. The British are coming. The British are coming. On April 14, 1775, British General Thomas Gage sent forces to seize colonial arms stored in Concord, Massachusetts. Paul Revere, among others, set out across the area to warn fellow patriots of the incoming troops in the middle of the night. However, he did not go about shouting, the British are coming. In fact, he most likely was not doing much shouting at all in the middle of the night with British patrols potentially crawling around the area. Secondly, he wouldn't have told his fellow patriots that the British were coming. The Declaration of Independence was still over a year to come. The Colonials at this time still saw themselves as members of the British Empire, albeit dissatisfied ones. Rather, it appears he went around saying, the regulars are coming out. Number 9. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. This quote has been attributed to a number of big-brained people such as Einstein and Benjamin Franklin but appears to have become popular only in recent times. The origin of the quote may be from as recent as 1983 in Rita Mae Brown's book Sudden Death. Number 10. Be the change you want to see in the world. I won't spend too much time on this one because it's more paraphrasing than anything, but according to the New York Times, Mahatma Gandhi actually said, if we could change ourselves, the tendencies in the world would also change. As a man changes his own nature, so does the attitude of the world change towards him. We need not wait to see what others do. Number 11. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. It's hard to hear as the quote was mangled by the radio transmission, but as my fifth grade science teacher pointed out, and as Neil Armstrong himself claimed, while taking the first step onto the moon, he said, it's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. Which really makes much more sense, given that man and mankind essentially mean the same thing. And there we have it. I'm not sure how many good stories I just ruined for people, but I also don't really care. It's my job to pull the fiction out of history. Anyway, let me know in the comments if there are any other quotes out there that have been misattributed or invented in history. I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, I invite you to come check out the rest of Fire of Learning and to subscribe to see more videos like this in the future. To help with the cost of production, a donation on Patreon would be a big help. A special thanks to our patrons once again listed here. We are also on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, so come check us out there too. Thank you for watching. And, uh, always remember, Keep it real, homie. Yeah, you can quote me on that.